Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, uh, everyone. So on behalf of the uh, Educational Committee of the ACNS, uh, I'm I'm so honored to uh, to welcome all of you to this uh, ACNS one as a webinar today. So uh, today uh, our chair will be uh, Professor Takashi uh, Kawahiro, who is the professor and chairman of the uh, Department of Neurosurgery, director uh, of the uh, Lomo Pressure Hydrocephalus Center at the uh, Asushi Neurosurgical Hospital in Japan. So uh, today uh, we have uh, three uh, speakers. Our, the first uh, expert speaker is uh, uh, Professor uh, Bermans, uh, who is talk uh, who, who will be talking about the repetition endoscopy and research efforts to understand shunt more function. Uh, the, the next one speaker will be endoscopic approaches to uh, tuberculum cell meningioma uh, by uh, Professor Hiroki uh, Mor Morisako. And also uh, another expert speaker who will be talking on transcranial anatomy of the cavernous sinus and surgical applications uh, by Professor uh, Nunes uh, Messiniano. Uh, to get, uh, uh, together with me, we have uh, Professor Wickham, who is, uh, who is the Associate Professor of Neurosurgery in the Bombay Hospital and Medical Research Center in Mumbai, India, as a discussion. Another discussion today uh, with, uh, is uh, Professor Alberto uh, Felitti, uh, who is the Associate Professor at the School of Medicine uh, and at the University of Verona in Italy. So uh, together uh, with me as a moderators, we have uh, Dr. Sachin and uh, uh, Dr. Atik and also uh, Dr. Israel. So uh, maybe shall I in invite uh, Professor Takashi uh, to introduce our first speaker. Okay. Mm. I'm Takashi Kawahara. It is an honor to be chair today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kato. Uh, I'm introducing the uh, first speaker, uh, Professor Iskanda. Uh, he is a director of pediatrics neurosurgery university of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics, uh, Wisconsin Madison, uh, USA. Uh, I'm interested in uh, INPH, and I do uh, LP Shanto so much. Uh, but today, I, I want to learn uh, about uh, VP Shanto for infants uh, very much. Uh, please start your presentation titled VP Shunt Endoscopy and Research Efforts to Understand Shunt Malf Mal Malfunction. Uh, please start, Professor Iskandar. Well, I, I very much appreciate uh, the... I'm sorry, I let me share again. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kato and uh, and the ACNS. Um, this is my first time talking to the Asian Congress and, and it's a, a, a big pleasure for me. Um, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. I do many, many endoscopic shunts and over the years, I've learned a few lessons. Uh, first, I've learned about how to avoid complications with shunts, with specific, specifically with shunt endoscopy. And second, uh, when you practice for as many years as I have, you learn a few lessons from research and how to improve uh, shunt function in, in patients. So I'm gonna give you more of an illustrative uh, account of what we've done over the years, how we improved our own shunt function. And uh, hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. So uh, the problem with pediatric hydrocephalus is that the majority of patients, despite endoscopy, despite uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomies, the majority of patients are still shunted. And the problem with shunts is that almost 40% of them will fail by the first year of life or after shunting. And then by the time the child is five to 10, uh, most of the shunts have failed. 
which is really significant considering that when Halter came up with the valve in the 1950s, the uh, shunt obstruction rate was exactly the same as it is now. The other observation is that the majority of uh, shunt failures occur in the proximal catheter of the shunt, which means that uh, there's something, there's a problem uh, within the ventricle that is causing these shunts to obstruct. So um, endoscopy can be done with a variety of different endoscopes. Uh, this is the neuropen on the left, uh, this is a, a disposable scope that goes inside the shunt catheter. On the right is a non-disposable endoscope that goes inside the shunt catheter. Uh, and then, of course, the rigid endoscope, which is what we all are used to doing with the more complex cases. It's higher quality, uh, but it's much bigger. So uh, the illustrations I'm going to show uh, are a combination of these endoscopes. The flexible ones are small, they fit inside the catheter. There's no need to enlarge the track around the catheter. Whereas the rigid ones are much higher resolution, they allow instruments, they allow cyst fenestrations, blood clot removal, etc., and they allow continuous irrigation with fluid egress. Um, the goals of shunt endoscopy include safe catheter removal, Oftentimes, these catheters are embedded in the brain, and when they're removed, it can cause bleeding from tearing of vessels or choroid plexus or ependema. Optimal new catheter placement. When we go with direct visualization of the ventricle, we can choose where, where we place the tip. It's not blinded. And the third is optimal long-term catheter survival, and that's the interest I have with the research, which we will discuss uh, in the second half of the talk. Shunt endoscopy can give you all these views. Uh, these are catheters with tissue embedded in them. These are catheters with a, with a sleeve of tissue that formed around them. This is looking inside the catheter. And this is during endoscopy when we're doing a concomitant uh, cyst fenestration or septal fenestration. So this is an example of safe catheter removal. I'm going inside the catheter. You can see the holes on the side. And then we come out the end and we can see exactly where the catheter is positioned, whether there are obstructions around it. This is uh, endoscopy outside the catheter so that if there is something attached on the outside, it can be removed safely. We don't have to make a new track to get the catheter into the shunt system. And it's not blind. We know exactly where we're going. And this is uh, going outside the catheter. You can see there is tissue attached to it, which using uh, cautery, we can safely dissect the tissue around the catheter so that we can enter safely. And this is after removing the, the catheter, you can go through the same track so that you don't damage uh, or create new tracks in the brain. So this is a, these are a, 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 um, uh, just a series of illustrations to show you the different things that we can do with, with catheters, uh, with the endoscopy and the shunt. And here you can see that even with small, tiny ventricles, we can enter with an endoscope and safely position the catheter. Um, sometimes when there are loculations in the ventricles, uh, during shunt um, uh, revision, we can fenestrate the loculations so that we, uh, again, allow optimal placement of the catheter. You can see here in the scan how there are loculations that can be fenestrated. In this case, we're fenestrating the septum and then we can put the tip of the catheter on the other side of the septum. Okay, so 
as I've done hundreds and hundreds of uh, endoscopic shunt revisions and placements over the years, I started noting unusual findings. After we removed the catheter, we see these bumps along the catheter track. They're very organized. They're like a row of trees down a highway. And we wondered what these are. And as we did more, we found various iterations of these bumps. Some seem to be damaged. Some seem to be very highly organized. And the question is, what is it that is causing these bumps? And after years and years of, of endoscopic shunts, I will tell you that the majority of children who are shunted in infancy will have these bumps. So we started looking more into it. And what we found is that these bumps called ependymal bands correspond exactly to the orifices or the holes in the catheter. Then we wondered, is this related to inflammation or is this related to, uh, to suction? What is it that making these bumps or ependymal bands grow into the, the, uh, the holes? And what we found is that it's suction that's causing this. So in this particular video, uh, we disconnected the catheter from the valve. And whenever the catheter is allowed to drain, the tissue will be forced into the, the, the orifices of the catheter. And whenever we close the catheter, not allow it to, brain, to drain, the tissues separate from the catheter. So that really proved to us that these ependymal bands are formed because of suction from the catheter. That means that these patients are overshunting. Now, when the, uh, when the overshunting is mild, uh, the previous video showed you how the, the, the tissue can come in and then come, can separate once the, once, once the, uh, catheter is not uh, uh, is not draining. However, over time, these ependymal bands get stiff and start to attach to the catheter, and they're adherent and they're difficult to remove. They don't reverse by themselves. And if we wait even longer, they can get very severe, and they can grow into the shunt catheter. And the only way to get rid of them is by uh, breaking them off, uh, in this case, with uh, endoscopic cautery. We have to, uh, you can imagine that if you try to pull a catheter like this uh, without trying to get rid of these bands, uh, you can cause hemorrhage and you can cause uh, more damage within the brain. Which means that early on in the process after shunting, the ventricles collapse, tissue gets pulled into the catheter, and then we have in intermittent obstructions, which is what I believe is the cause of slit ventricle syndrome in children. The, the, the tissue is soft enough that the moment the catheter obstructs, the uh, ICP goes up, the uh, tissues separate, the catheter opens again. So you have intermittent episodes or cycles of headaches, vomiting, etc. However, over time, they get stuck. In this case, some of the holes are obstructed, some of the holes are not. This catheter is still working, but it's adherent. And you can see how this part of the ventricle is completely collapsed around the catheter. And if we wait even longer, then the tissue gets sucked into the catheter and causes a sudden obstruction um, as, and sudden shunt failure. And even if the, the ventricle ends up dilating, that tissue remains in the catheter. So our hypothesis then, based on our observations, is that there is chronic shunt overdrainage in most kids who are shunted. The uh, ventricles collapse, and especially the ventricle that is surrounding the catheter 
where the holes of the catheter are, they form these ependymal bands that obstruct the catheter either temporarily or permanently. So what do we do about this? So if indeed shunt overdrainage is creating shunt obstructions, can we decrease shunt overdrainage and improve the obstruction rate in these children? So what we did next is we decided to place anti-siphon devices in the shunt systems separated by a distance from the primary valve. So by definition, you have two valves in the shunt system in series. And what we found uh, is that in simple patients, which means patients who've not had a lot of shunt revisions in their lives, at one year, we cut down the proximal shunt obstruction rate by almost 70% and by five years, 40%. But when we looked at patients who are very complicated, who've had a lot of shunt revisions in their lifetime, more than 10, we improved shunt obstruction rates even more. 76% at one year, 66% at five years, which meant to us and confirmed that many of the obstructions that are occurring in these patients are related to chronic shunt overdrainage. So what are the mechanisms of overdrainage? Well, what we know is that gravity causes uh, the, the more drainage to happen in shunt system. This is what we all recognize. Every time someone stands up, there is a column of water that puts pressure on this valve. So a valve that say that has an opening pressure of 20, uh, when we stand up, we might have up to 50 or 70, uh, depending on your height of a water column over the shunt, and that valve is going to open. However, what we have uh, identified and what others have uh, uh, discussed before is that there are also forces on the shunt that makes it open, such as cardiac pulsations and Valsalva maneuvers. This is a great uh, paper that was written uh, more than 10 years ago, where a patient's ICP was monitored over 24 hours. And uh, what the researchers found is that there are spikes in ICP with various routine daily activities, such as waking up in the morning, watching TV, having a bowel movement, uh, having breakfast, coffee. Uh, and of course, when someone is sleeping versus when someone is, um, is uh, getting up and, and moving around which means that overdrainage can happen not just in the upright position due to gravity, but also in the supine position due to these forces. So we set up a valve testing platform that's quite sophisticated at our center. And this is what it looks like. Um, and the, uh, the advantage of this shunt testing platform is this is the valve that we want to test. And the uh, platform allows us to do three things. We can initiate pressure pulses, which would be equivalent to Valsalva maneuvers or cardiac pulsations. We can initiate uh, changes in compliance and we can measure compliance. And then we can simulate gravity. So we can simulate many of the physiological conditions that happen in the brain when you have a shunt in place. And we can measure ICP, both in the pseudoventricle here, as well as before and after the valve. And I'm going to show you some of the results that we've gotten over the years uh, to try to study this aspect of chronic shunt overdrainage. So first, what we found is that indeed gravity drives drainage or overdrainage. Uh, in this case, when you have no valve, uh, the CSF outflow is much higher in the upright position than in the supine position. And when we put a valve, this is improved, but you still have an, upri a, a, um, an upright uh, drainage that is at least three times as high as the supine drainage, which means that even with valve systems, where gravity continues to drain into shunts 
much more than we would like. The second thing we found is that when we initiate pulsations into the shunt system, we also increase drainage, especially in the horizontal position. The vertical position is overwhelmed by gravity, and that's the dominant force that creates the drainage pattern. However, the horizontal position where there's no gravity involved, the more the pulsations, the more the drainage. Um, the third um, issue that we found is that the lower the compliance, the higher the pulse pressure, and therefore the higher the drain, which means that you can imagine a child who has a recent shunt placement, uh, which means has very high compliance, will not drain as much as a child who's been shunted for several years, who has developed stiff compliance into the brain, which means that uh, any of these, any uh, gravity or any Valsalva maneuvers can cause more drainage than one would expect. And I often wonder whether NPH is that type of a situation where there's stiffness in the brain uh, and the shunts tend to drain. And then when we simulated our double shunt valve system or placement of the anti-siphon devices, we found that the placement of an anti-siphon device, especially in the upright position, significantly decreases the drainage pattern of a shunt system. Okay. So what I've just illustrated to you is that, uh, is that endoscopy can help at, uh, significantly in preventing uh, shunt complications and shunt obstructions. Uh, we have uh, different types of endoscopes we can choose from. The goals, again, are safe catheter removal, optimal new catheter placement, up to long-term uh, catheter survival. We can use a variety of adjuncts, uh, neuronavigation, we can, uh, the, the uh, catheter insertion approaches, et cetera. The second set of conclusions that I've uh, just uh, showed you is that gravity seems to drive CSF outflow in the vertical position to create a chronic overdrainage uh, mechanism in shunt systems. That CSF pulsations can also drive increased outflow even in the horizontal position, especially in the horizontal position. That the lower the compliance of the brain, the more this chronic overdrainage effect happens. And then these pulsations can be either induced by Valsalva maneuvers or can be physiological, such as cardiac pulses. This is John Holter, who brought to us the first uh, differential pressure valve in the 1950s. And unfortunately, all the valves that have been designed since have not been able to cut down on the shunt obstruction rates. So uh, my observations seem to indicate that really understanding shunt, uh, shunt function is crucial before we design future shunt systems. So this is the team that I work with. Um, I uh, thank the funding agencies that helped us, especially the Theodore Batterman Family Foundation. And thank you again for the kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Burns. And uh, shall I invite uh, our chair, Professor Takashi, uh, to comment on the um, presentation. Uh, we, uh, there are two uh, this center. Uh, so first, uh, we want to some question and comment from this guy. To this stunt. So, uh, Dr. Kamaka. Uh, Professor uh, Iskandar, thanks. Thank you, um, Professor Takashi. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, very nice presentation, very interesting uh, 
research into uh, causes of shunt blockage. Just one technical question. Uh, do you use uh, thulium laser for breaking uh, when you're removing the shunt? Do you use laser at all or how do you use, uh, what do you use to actually break the adhesions? I use uh, electrocautery. Okay. Yeah, it's right. it's very simple. It's readily available. It's much less expensive than laser. Um, you know, even with with uh, things like bug bee wires, uh, these are very easy to use. Right. Uh, may I ask one more question, uh, Professor? Please. Yeah. So, what would be the role of a secondary endoscopic third ventriculostomy in appropriate cases, uh, rather than revising the shunt? What would uh, be your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. I've actually looked into this in, in my series, and there have been a couple of papers in the past couple of years in our literature. Uh, in my series, I when I see patients in clinic, I always have in the back of my mind, the first question that comes to mind, can I get rid of their shunt? <laughs> and um, so we uh, have looked into this, and I have almost 100 patients that we're, we're looking at uh, where I tried to get rid of their shunts. Some of them I've done endoscopic third ventricostomies on, and some of them I didn't. The ones that I didn't do an ETV on are ones where I thought that maybe they don't need the shunt. And our success rate is about 50%. So um, if you consider that we can make up to 50% of patients shunt independent after having been shunted, this is an excellent, uh, I think, way to, to go forward. So yes, uh, I encourage it. I, because we struggle so much with shunts and we struggle, these patients struggle at home and they're always afraid their shunt is going to fail, that to try to get rid of it would be an excellent thing to do. And there are a couple of papers uh, in the recent literature in Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, uh, one by the HCRN, uh, by rock at all uh, that showed very similar results. Right. We we had a slightly more favorable uh, sort of uh, outcome with secondary endos endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Our successes in pediatrics went up to almost 70%, though our numbers may not be so great. But uh, it was just a thought, uh, if we can convert the shunts to an yeah. ETV. Well, you know, as you know, it all depends on the etiology of the hydrocephalus, right? Good. Correct. So if your patient population has a predominance of aqueductal stenosis, for example, the success rate will be higher. Right. Uh, and so, but it's an it's a great thing to do, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, another discussant, uh, Dr. Uh, Heriti, uh, Please give any question or comment for this presentation. Yes, thank you, Professor Takashi. And uh, thank you, Professor Iskandar, for this very interesting presentation. Actually, I have uh, several questions. Um, so about your first, the first part of your presentation, so how much useful uh, endoscopy is to uh, manage uh, ventricular catheter, I completely agree with you. Actually, I, I also use endoscopy sometimes in such cases. I perfectly remember one case uh, when I had to remove a VP shunt, a ventricular uh, catheter of a VP shunt from a patient with a, a VHL disease. She uh, was carrying a hemangioblastoma at the level of the infundibulum. So uh, fortunately, I thought about inspecting directly the catheter mm -hmm. before removing. And uh, I was lucky enough because actually I have seen the tip of the catheter, which was connected to the hemangioblastoma by a very thin uh, fibrotic uh, uh, tissue. We published this case actually, and we removed, uh, we cut this uh, fibrotic tissue uh, with the uh, Bugby uh, using the endoscope uh, before removing uh, the catheter. So uh, without the endoscope, uh, in that case, probably we would had, have had a catastrophe, maybe, potentially. 
But my question is, uh, do you use endoscopy in every case when you have to remove uh, a VP shunt or a catheter or you select the, the, the patients uh, where you have to use an endoscope? Because uh, as I said, I, I had the idea to inspect in that case, but honestly, I don't use endoscopy for all cases I have to revise. This is my first question. Uh, my second question is about the second part of your uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, you showed the importance of the anti-siphon device uh, in our VP shunt procedures. Do you after after the results of your uh, of your study? Do you always implant an anti siphon in your in all your patients, or it depends on the kind of hydrocephalus, or I don't know. And the third, and I promise, last question is about uh, actually uh, the the endoscopes you are using at the beginning of your presentation you mentioned about of course the possibility to use a flexible or a rigid endoscope and uh, you mentioned only the very thin uh, endoscopes uh, flexible endoscopes uh, without uh, uh, an operative uh, uh, channel but actually there are uh, flexible endoscopes with an operative channel. Uh, and you also correctly said that the rigid endoscope has a better quality uh, of image. But nowadays, there are also uh, some video endoscopes with a chip on the tip, which yeah. unfortunately in Europe we cannot buy, as probably you know, because of the very strict rules of the European Union, but in the States, you are very lucky and you can use. So I would like a comment uh, about this topic, if you think that the introduction of these new endoscopes can, should push us towards a flexible endoscopy rather than a rigid endoscopy in the ventricles. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felletti. These are great questions. Uh, I have an anecdote myself. One time I had to extract a catheter from the prepontine system that was attached to the basilar artery. So you can imagine if we had tried to do it blindly. Um, so uh, when I started my practice, um, I thought of three things that pushed me toward using a shunt endoscopy on most of my shunt patients. You know, obviously, if the ventricles are huge, you, you don't need an endoscope to go in and out. One is because I've, I was convinced that it must be safer. You know, the more we see, the better we, I mean, we, we've learned it with microsurgery. We certainly should be learning it with endoscopy. I, I felt it was safer. The second thing is I felt that, you know, what makes us better microsurgeons? You know, what made Yasher girl who he is? is sitting for thousands of hours under the microscope and practicing, okay? So if I'm doing 100 shunts a year and I do them all endoscopically, endoscopy becomes part of my, my hands. You know, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to think of how to navigate in the ventricle. So at the moment then I have a big tumor that I wanna remove endoscopically. I don't need to worry about, uh, you know, navigating in the ventricles it makes you more natural. The practice is so important. And having residents be able to practice with us like this is important. Now, obviously, what prevents us from doing this? The cost. So when I first started, we were using the Neuropens and Neuropens at the time were very expensive. And I started looking around and I found this flexible disposable endoscope a non-disposable endoscope by Claris at the time, who, which is the team that really, that made the Neuropen endoscope before selling it to Medtronic. Um, and uh, what I found is that I could get a uh, hundred cases out of that shunt before I have to repair it or, or send it out, which means that I cut down significantly on cost. So I didn't feel, I didn't feel that I wasn't being cost effective. And so, and over the years, um, anecdotally, I have so many cases like the one you've you've uh, talked about. You know, you had an instinct to go in and use the endoscope of this particular patient, right? 
but instinct sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. I think if we're always prepared, we're always going to be doing a better job. Um, in terms of uh, anti-siphon devices, uh, I absolutely uh, do put an anti-siphon device on every patient that I shunt. And anytime I have to do a shunt revision, if the patient doesn't have an anti-siphon device, I add it. And um, I can tell you that early in my practice, the first 10 or 15 years, it was a terrible uh, a practice where you'd have patients come in uh, week after week, month after month with multiple revisions. And it was terrible. The ventricles collapsed, you formed adhesions. Um, and um, I don't have a lot of these anymore. And I, you, you know, yes, maybe we are as a field a little bit more hesitant in operating on kids with headaches who have a shunt. But still, what I find is that when you increase the pressure in the ventricle by adding antisiphon devices, the ventricles stay a little bit more dilated and they're unlikely to obstruct the catheter. And in fact, when you look at some of the uh, John Kessel's data from the HCRN from years ago, the only factor that's ever been associated with decreased shunt obstruction rate is when you look at the scan, you have CSF around the catheter. So finally, the endoscopes. I, I fully agree that flexible endoscopy is the way to go with this. The, the issue though is not the matter of flexibility. It's a matter of having a one millimeter endoscope that goes inside the catheter and that pokes at the, uh, from the hole from the end. And that's the flexibility that I need. I don't want to go in and have to destroy the track of the catheter in order to introduce an endoscope. Because the endoscopes that have a channel in them, they're at least three, four millimeters. You know, they're, they're the flexible endoscope we use for ETV CPC, for example. And, and those, uh, the, the track that forms around the, the, the shunt catheter is usually one to 1.5 millimeters. So you have to destroy it to get back into it. Whereas the one millimeter endoscope that goes inside the catheter or goes through the same track, you're not making any, any new uh, trajectories and you're not creating any more damage. Uh, and of course, digital endoscopy is the way the future. I've been uh, really waiting um, impatiently to have one of those one millimeter digital endoscopes, which would be amazing. But uh, the companies are not yet allowing surgeons to use it except to you know clean devices and clean endoscopes and etc thank you for your question thank you very much uh, thank you very much uh, uh, dr iskandar uh, i have some question uh, i do LP shunt so much. So uh, I, uh, my case is sometimes over drainage. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, CT findings are uh, ventricle narrowing and subdural hematoma. Mm -hmm. uh, infants often yeah. uh, slit ventricle not yeah. a subdural hematoma. Uh, what do you think the uh, difference uh, adult, uh, elderly people, and infants? Uh, yeah, that's Takashi, this is a great question too. So I've been working with um, the team at Mbali in Uganda uh, to, to look at exactly this issue. Uh, you know, Steve Schiff has published a series last year in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, where he studied the Ugandan population <clears throat> and found that there was a almost a 40% risk of subdural hematomas or subdural collections after shunting. And then what uh, with my discussions with him and with the Mbali group, we realize that that population is divided into two populations. If, some, if, if a child comes in late with a big head and huge ventricles, 
and you shunt them. And the ventricles have no way to collapse because he doesn't have enough tissue. Then you develop subdural hygromas or subdural hematomas. However, if the child comes in early in the hydrocephalus management, such as someone born with a myelomeningocele, for example, they discover the hydrocephalus relatively early. The head is not huge. The head is reasonable in size. The brain can still uh, expand the parenchyma. Then what happens is the ventricles collapse and you end up with slit ventricle syndrome. So I suspect that the patient population, the adult patient population, is more like the first group than the second group. The ventricles never collapse. You know, they're stiff over the years. But there is only so much room in the skull. If the ventricles are going to be pulled to come down, come down become smaller, then something has to give. And the easiest thing to give is the subdural space. So, uh, and I mentioned briefly in my presentation that I suspect NPH is, is one of those situations where you have a stiffer brain because you're older and you have a, a fixed skull uh, and you have a head that's not huge. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Uh, I understand very much. Uh, yeah. And... I think my, my patient uh, operated by a patient. So yes. a patient uh, drain, drain CSF from uh, Lumba. So right. brain easily uh, slow down uh, and uh, open subdural space. Yes. Uh, I, but you, your idea, uh, your, your opinion is very uh, good for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean... And, uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. Uh, and I, I have a, another question. Uh, um, <clears throat> ETB, ETB is... Uh, sometimes effective for infant uh, hydrocephalus, but adult INPH uh, mm -hmm. patient, not so much effective. Mm -hmm. um, what what yeah. is your opinion, the difference? Yeah. Well, I, I will address the first comment. <clears throat> so, you know, we have children or adults who have an excess of pressure in their brain, okay? So let's say you and I function at an, a level of five, you know, zero to five uh, ICP. And then these children have a pressure of 20, yeah, okay, yeah. Or, or more. So what we're doing, what we want to do, the goal, is to bring them from 20 to five or 10. But what we're doing with the shunt systems that we have, which are all dependent on gravity, no matter what type of technology they have. We bring them from 20 to minus 10. Whether it's a lumbar shunt or a ventricular shunt. The difference is that the ventricular shunt, once you overdrain, the, the ventricles collapse and obstruct the catheter, whereas the lumbar shunt, you don't have ventricles. So you're not going to obstruct the catheter. Instead, you're creating less compliance within the brain, the brain contracts, you end up with subdurals, you might have a Chiari malformation secondarily. And so regardless, what, what our goal should be is how can we achieve the highest pressure that the person will tolerate, but not less than that. So if your lumbar shunt, let's say you have an ICP monitor every time you place a lumbar shunt and you say, I'm going to add valves or I want to change the pressure on the valve enough so that my ICP is five, not minus five. We would be doing so many people a favor by, by doing it this way, whether it's a lumbar or a ventricular shunt. Thank you very much. And uh, adult uh, INPH. Uh, right. Don't... So, I don't know, you know, ETV has, we've learned a lot about ETV early in my practice. We avoided doing ETVs on patients who didn't have an obvious obstruction 
And now we find out that even ch children that we think have communicating hydrocephalus, 50% of them could respond to ETV. So we don't understand the pathophysiology behind this. And I encourage pe people to shunt, to, to do ETVs before doing a shunt on patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage and pH, some of these adult etiologies that we don't understand as well. But it depends on how much of a failure rate you're willing to take, really. Thank you very much. I understood very much. Thank you. And uh, you can see there are some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sharaf, uh, Sharaf, you have uh, some question. You have typed it in your box. Maybe you can ask in person. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Momo Shujan Sharif. I'm a neurosurgeon working uh, in Dhaka Medical College, Bangladesh. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your excellent uh, presentation. And it's a, a new uh, thing for us. Uh, it's a new technique. I have one question uh, regarding, uh, do you use uh, endo arm to hold that uh, telescope? Uh, this is one question. And uh, I have another question. Uh, is there any difference uh, between catheter placement of frontal horn and occipital horn? Is there any difference of uh, over drainage or drainage pressure uh, in placement of uh, frontal horn and occipital horn? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharif. Uh, so I do not use the endo arm. Um, early in my practice, I was using it more uh, or an equivalent of the endo arm. But then I realized I needed flexibility. Uh, these are not very long cases, and I need flexibility uh, with my hands, which the endo arm adds an element of stiffness to. Um, and when you have a good uh, assistant, uh, like a resident, uh, usually you can go back and forth, and, and you don't need as much assistance from an arm. Um, frontal versus occipital, I personally don't think there's a difference. I really think that in the past, when people tried to figure out what causes shunt malfunctions, they were looking at all kinds of parameters, such as frontal versus occipital, or whether uh, you know an OSV valve is better than a, a differential pressure valve, or uh, et cetera. And none of the studies has, have ever shown uh, a true consistent or statistically significant difference. And I'm not surprised by this because what we seem to show with our series is that gravity is really the dominant factor here that is creating a lot of the troubles that we're creating. Now you could argue that an occipital shunt will add maybe more, five more centimeters of gravity. And that may be true, but when you have 50, you add five, maybe it adds a little bit of an element. So early in my practice, I was doing occipital shunts. That was my routine. And then uh, I decided, when I decided that I needed to add anti-siphon devices in the shunt system, and I didn't want them attached to the valve, and I can talk about this later if you'd like, I wanted them separated by a distance. The only place I could put them is on, over the clavicle because the occipital shunt is here. So then a few years ago, I changed to frontal shunts because then I put the primary valve here and the secondary valve here. It's much more convenient with growth. It doesn't interfere with growth of a child. Now, the question that, that you might have next is, so why do you want to separate the anti-siphon device from the primary valve? Why not use a delta valve that has an anti-siphon in it? The way that I, uh, I've described it to people trying to give an example is that if you can imagine you have two doors side by side and you kick the first one open, the pressure of the air is going to kick the second one open as well. However, if you separate the doors by a corridor and you kick this one open, the second one isn't going to be affected. The pressure will be streamlined by the time it gets to the second one. So what our benchtop testing is showing us now that the ultimate uh, distance is at least five centimeters. And in fact, about 30 years ago, there was a paper from Japan that did an experimental study that actually showed this, that showed that you need to have, you know, wider distance between the, 
the valve and the and the anticyte. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your excellent presentation and uh, making us understand. Thank you. Okay, and uh, if is there is uh, are there any questions uh, uh, from also from Adrisem? I I thought you raised your hands uh, once. Maybe Doctor Ben. Ben is no more. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, if yeah. there is. A, Sorry, no sorry, uh, Dr. Sam, Sam from Malaysia. Yes. He, he raised a hand before. Yes. Uh, another one is one from. Uh, yes, sorry. another one from. Uh, Yashi. Yash, Yashi. Hello, Yashi. Can you uh, hear us? Please unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, yes. Hello, you are audible. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, excellent lecture, Professor. Sir, uh, how do you manage multi populated uh, hydrocephalus case? Yes. Uh, th this is uh, also a great question. You know, pediatric neurosurgeons are plagued by multi populated hydrocephalus. Some children are born with meningitis. And that can immediately cause multilocalated hydrocephalus, but chronic shunting can also do this. So um, over the years, what I learned is that there are two things that we need to do. One is we have to make sure that they communicate. And I use dye studies. I, I put dye in the catheter and I get CT scans to see where the dye goes. But the, but the second and, and very important factor is that you don't want the ventricles or the loculations to collapse. Right. So it goes with the same theme that I've been talking about yeah. is that over drainage, when you allow catheter, when you allow ventricles or loculations to collapse, they form more adhesions, they form more loculations over time. And eventually uh, new loculations are going to form. So the two-step approach is one, you make sure that everything communicates. I think someone has the... Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so two-step approach. One, we make sure that everything communicates and I, I make sure with dye studies, CT dye studies. But the second, I make sure that, that we don't create collapse, which means that I, I put uh, two valves in series and I, with a programmable valve that I keep dialing it up until the ventricles dilate just enough so that those loculations don't collapse and, 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 and have more adhesions for. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor. And uh, also any comments from uh, uh, Professor Pritchard? Hello, konnichiwa, salam alaikum. Uh, thank you, Professor Skandar, uh, for great presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we use uh, the simple BP shunt. We don't have endoscope in Afghanistan, and we haven't uh, experience for uh, doing uh, endoscopic neurosurgery, especially putting a shunt for this. And uh, still we use, and we use uh, only uh, the mid-pressure uh, BP shunt and uh, still be, uh, as you mentioned, we saw the complication over the drainage and um, uh, abstraction of shunts and uh, adhesion and uh, misplacement of shunts. Uh, it's a routine uh, complication we saw in, here in Afghanistan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perzad. Uh, I, I fully understand that most of the world doesn't have what, what we have in the US or in Europe. But, you know, I think if you, if we, if I get something out of the, the whole presentation I gave is less the endoscopy and more the dynamics of the CSF dynamics of shots. Yes. Endoscopy will decrease some of the complications, but that's in a small number of patients. It's not in a huge number of patients. 
You know, most of the time when you put a shunt in, you have huge ventricles, you don't need endoscopy for this. However, if you can keep the pressure in the ventricle higher than what we're used to, I think you will find that you will have less complications long-term. And, you know, early on in my practice, before we had these uh, sophisticated anti-siphon devices or gravitational devices that Esculap, for example, has now, I used to put two valves in series, two differential pressure valves in series and separate them by a distance. That was what I did early in my series. Uh, as I said, I'm working with the, the Mbali group in Uganda on this. They have now a big series of patients where they use two Shabra valves in series. Now, we don't know the results yet, uh, but, uh, but the idea is that we're overdoing it. We've been overdoing it for 60 years. And it's, it's uh, what we're discovering is that too much shunting is worse than a little bit of shunting. Um, so that, that would be my advice, is that instead of using one valve, use two valves. And, and even programmable valves, you say, well, we, you know, it would be nice to have programmable valves, but programmable valves have not been shown to improve uh, obstruction rates. And the reason for it is that if you think that programmable valves, even if you dial it to the highest possible setting, okay, let's imagine the Sirtas valve has a, a virtual off setting of 40, right? 40 centimeters of water. Well, when an adult stands up, you have at least 60 centimeters of water pressing on the shunt system, which means that it doesn't matter what you dial that, that valve system to, it's going to overdrain. So the only way to do it really is to add another point of resistance. Yes, definitely. A very good point, and Professor, and also, uh, but uh, in, in the case of uh, you have put in two programmable art in series, how, how can you adjust, how, how would you adjust the pressure? If there is so, a, uh, yeah, one. only the first one is programmable. Now, yes. uh, nowadays, and what I found actually anecdotally is that when I started adding anti siphon devices into shunt systems, the programmable valves have become more accurate because you've taken away a lot of the gravitational force, you're allowing the programmable valve to do what it's supposed to do. Now, if you want to give it, give it more sophistication, um, you know, Esculap now has an M-Blue valve, which is, which is a programmable gravitational device, which means that you change the setting only in the upright position. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that I've started to use as the anti-siphon device, which means you would have a regular programmable valve here and an M-Blue valve here. And in fact, uh, you know, a few years ago, it may have been at the ISPN meeting, I think it was in Denver, I met a Japanese neurosurgeon, I don't remember his name, and he was telling me about what he uses, and, and, and that was years ago, and he said he uses a programmable valve as a primary valve, and a PROSA valve, which is an, a gravitational programmable valve as a secondary uh, device, and I was at the time surprised that uh, that people were were doing this even that that many years ago. Um, I see. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Prisad, and also Professor Bernie. So, are there any questions from the floor? So, if not, shall I invite uh, Professor Takashi to introduce our next speaker? Okay. Uh, next 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 speaker is. Young neurosurgeon, but uh, uh, first, but first, I emphasize. I, I want to emphasize that uh, Doctor uh, Morisako is uh, not a young neurosurgeon, but uh, one of the expert of Japanese neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, Professor Hiroki Morisako is. Uh, the neurosurgeon uh, of the Department of Neurosurgery Graduated School Medicine, Osaka Metropolitan University. Metropolitan University is combined uh, from se several universities last year. Uh, very big 
university. Uh, so please start uh, your presentation titled Endoscopic Approaches for Tuberculosis Cell Meningiomas. Uh, please speak, uh, Professor Morisato. Yeah, okay, so thank you, so uh, the Professor uh, Kawahara, uh, so uh, kind uh, introduce for me. And also the, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Kato and the member of the ACNS uh, giving uh, me the uh, opportunity of the presentation uh, for the such a the, uh, special the, uh, conference so webinar. Uh, so I'm now the, uh, uh, learning the uh, skull base surgery the, under the uh, professor uh, Kenji Ohate and the professor uh, Takeo Goto. Uh, so the, today's my topic is endoscopy approach uh, for the tuberculosis cell meningioma. So uh, I'd like to so okay. yes, so the I'd like to start my presentation. So the in recent years, endoscopic surgery for tuberculosis cell melanomas has been reported with uh, exposure of the indications. Uh, here we report on the criteria for the selection of the endoscopy approaches and the result of the treatment of the tuberculosis cell meningiomas at our institution. So the uh, from 2018, the uh, about 30 cases of the tuberculosis cell meningiomas detected at uh, Osaka City University and Osaka Metropolitan University Hospital. The three cases had uh, uh, previous operation uh, or radiation, the, it's a recurrence tumors. So mean tumor diameter was uh, 24.4 millimeter. So this is uh, the, our recent uh, surgical strategy for the tuberculosis meningiomas. So uh, we usually uh, separate uh, two types of the tuberculosis meningiomas. So one is a plan of the attachment of the tumor is uh, a pranam spinodal to the tuberculum cell meningu cell, the, and the tumor size is large. Uh, we usually select the uh, interhemispheric approach, a microscopic transcranial, the conventional approach. Uh, if the size of the tumor is small to middle, uh, we uh, uh, recently select the eyebrow uh, subfrontal endoscopic approach. Uh, the, if the attachment of the tumor is tuberculum cell to the diaphragm cell and uh, the tumor has no lateral extension, we selected endoscopic endolensal approach. And if the, the type of the tumor has uh, uh, extremely lateral extension, we selected the microscopic uh, transcranial approach and uh, combined the uh, endoscopic endolensal approach. So at first, I uh, we explain the endoscopic endonasal approach for the tuberculum cell meningiomas. So this is a, a 59 years old female. The attachment tumor is uh, uh, tuberculum cell to the diaphragm cell. The, uh, her visual function is uh, deteriorated at the right side. Uh, we select the, this. So that this tumor has uh, some of the uh, image of the right cavernous sinus. Uh, we select uh, this tumor uh, for the endoscopic endonasal approach. So at first, we uh, drill out the uh, uh, white the bony structure around the tuberculum cell to the cell floor, and after that, the cut the uh, dura mater of the cell floor uh, slightly the right side, and uh, expose uh, the uh, tumor and the uh, normal pituitary gland, and uh, also that we uh, added the uh, 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 bony dissection around the dorsum cell and cut the diaphragma cell and uh, we perform the detach and the devascularize of the tumor, especially the midline. At first, we remove the uh, center uh, part of the tumor uh, like this. And after that, we uh, uh, dissect the tumor 
from the uh, left optic nerve and like this reticular three and after that the cut of the um, cavernous sinus side of the uh, dura mater and remove the tumor uh, very the carefully uh, the and finally they will reach to the lateral end uh, of the uh, right side of the tumor and remove that part of the tumor. So we remove the tumor, uh, including the superior component of the cavernous sinus, and release the uh, uh, tumor uh, uh, radically uh, with preserving the stalk and uh, the pituitary gland. So after this is a, a post-operative MR image, uh, we've uh, achieved uh, radical removal of the tumor and also the patient visual acuity uh, improved. So next case is uh, the recurrent tuberculum cellar and diaphragma cellar meningioma. So in this case, uh, the, we uh, removed the this tumor 2007 and uh, the microscopic transcranial approach. And after the uh, long follow-up, the residual tumor gradually grown up. So the, at, the, at that time, the patient already deteriorated the uh, left side uh, brain Yes, and the right side uh, gradually uh, uh, show the uh, worsening of the, uh, the visual function. So the main purpose of the surgery the, to the keep uh, uh, the right side the visual function. Uh, we the apply the endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, the, we remove the open the uh, uh, cellar floor widely, and also the we the. Uh, remove the bony structure on the tuberculosis cellar and cut the uh, heart, the tight, the connective tissue like this. So the we the, uh, reach the posterior edge of the uh, diaphragma and uh, the detach of the tumor was uh, the, uh, achieved. And after that, uh, we the perform the uh, internal developing of the tumor. The fortunately, the upper margin of the tumor, we could confirm the uh, fat graft that was uh, inserted at the previous operation. Uh, so that is a good landmark the, for this uh, the uh, second operation. So we uh, cut the uh, right lateral side of the uh, uh, dura mater and remove the tumor from the uh, uh, upper to the caudal side and the, the neticular three to remove the, this tumor like this. So finally, the, we completely achieved the decompression of the uh, optic chiasma and the left, uh, right side of the optic nerve like this. This is the final view. So after the operation, the, um, how the visual uh, acuity of the right side improved and the tumor that radically removed. So this is uh, the uh, relatively large, the tuberculum cella, diaphragm cella, meningioma. So the, this patient, the severely deteriorated uh, left side visual acuity and also the right side, uh, so visual acuity is uh, 0.6. So the, we also the, uh, selected endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, after the uh, cutting of the diaphragma, uh, so the the tumor uh, completely detached. So after that, the, we the uh, dissected from the tumor and the optic nerve, and uh, the tumor tightly adhered the left side uh, uh, posterior communicating artery. So that part uh, we intentionally remained, but the other part uh, we uh, could uh, remove. In this case, so this is uh, the post-operative MRI. The left side the visual acuity not improved, but the right side they improved. So this is a summary of the endoscopic and laser approach. Nine cases. So we uh, removed the tumor the radical release, uh, through the endoscopic and laser approach. So the uh, most patient the uh, preserve. Uh, the visual function or improved the, their visual function without any the severe complication. The, uh, only one case required the 
additional the newly the uh, hormonal replacement, but other patients not require. So next, uh, I will present the endoscopic superorbital eyebrow approach for tuberculum cell meningiomas. So the, this is uh, the cadaveric dissection of the endoscopic the superorbital eyebrow approach. So we make the uh, skin incision just above the eyebrow and uh, make the uh, small the uh, uh, chronotomy and uh, insert endoscope. At first, we can uh, see the olfactory nerve and the deeper side, uh, we uh, so can drill out the uh, uh, pranam sphenoidale to the tuberculum cell. And also the, uh, uh, through this approach, uh, the we can the open a bilateral of the canal. So the, this is uh, the, uh, uh, that's the case. So this is 40 years uh, or the male, the show the slight visual the dysfunction. The size of the tumor is uh, medium size and the uh, attachment of tumor is uh, tuberculum cell. So we apply the, this case, so the uh, endoscopic superorbital eyebrow approach. So this is a surgical video The we make the uh, uh, three, centimeter by three centimeter, the uh, small chronotomy. And after cutting the dura mater, we insert the endoscope. Uh, through the endoscope, the, we can the, uh, easily uh, identify the anterior edge of the tumor. And so uh, we uh, drill out the uh, tuberculum cell, uh, primus medullary, and also the open the optic canal. And after that, uh, we uh, started the uh, internal developing of the tumor and open the optic canal and the, uh, we uh, detach the tumor from the frontal base and also the optic nerve. So this the surgical procedure is almost the same of the microscopic the procedure, uh, but uh, under the microscope, we can clearly identify the margin of the tumor like this. And so the we finally achieved a symptom grade one tumor resection like this. The deconstruction of the uh, skull base uh, we the uh, put the fat graft and the uh, close the the wound the, the finished suppression. So this is a, a post-operative MR image. The tumor completely removed without any the complication. So next case is uh, the uh, the small size the prana spinal to the tuberculum cell meningioma. The, this patient has uh, severely deteriorated the visual acuity, especially the right side. Uh, the tumor located to the right side that. Tumor size is uh, relatively small, and the patient age uh, was uh, over the 70. So the, we selected less invasive the procedure. Uh, uh, this is a surgical video. Uh, we make the one bar hole, and uh, small the, after the small chronotomy, the, we drill out the uh, frontal base, and uh, after open the uh, uh, dura mater, uh, we inserted the uh, endoscope. Uh, through the endoscope, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, cut the uh, dura mater at the pranam sphenoidale to the tuberculum cell. And at first, the, in this case, we open the optic canal. And the, after that, the, we continuously the drill the uh, tuberculum cell and make the uh, we make the working space uh, we enlarge the working space at the frontal base and also the we the they vascularize and the, the tumor like this and after that uh, we cut the uh, optic canal of the tumor matter and uh, uh, start to remove the tumor. So the this tumor 
was uh, not so large, so the adhesion at the uh, surrounding structure uh, not so severe, so uh, we could easily remove that part of the tumor. The tumor, this tumor actually invaded optic canal severely, the inferior wall of the uh, optic canal, but uh, under the endoscope, we can remove that part. So finally, we achieved the Simpson grade one, the tumor rejection. So the reconstruction was performed by using a fat graft and finished the operation. So this is a post-operative dimer image. The hard visual acuity of the right side improved the uh, immediately after surgery. So this is uh, the summary of the seven cases of the endoscopic superorbital eyebrow approach. The tumor the radically uh, removed. So the comparison of the microscope and the endoscope surgery for the small to middle sized tuberculosis meningiomas. So the uh, this the uh, comparison the uh, size of the tumor are slightly the uh, large uh, the microscopic approach uh, group, uh, but the outcome of the uh, surgery is not so different, and so the uh, only the mean surgical time uh, was uh, the uh, significantly the, the shortened at the uh, endoscopic approach. So that the approach is uh, very the useful for the uh, small to middle-sized uh, tuberculosis cell meningiomas. So on the other hand, the, this is a relatively the uh, large the uh, tuberculosis cell meningiomas Planum spiroidale tuberculosis cell meningioma. The patient age the, about 50 and the visual acuity severely deteriorated the right side. So the, in such a case, we usually selected the uh, transcranial, the interhemispheric approach. We open the interhemispheric tissue and uh, expose the uh, uh, upper margin of the tumor. And in this case, the tumor the extended the lateral subfrontal side. The, we cut the olfactory nap and expose the, the tumor margin widely. And after that, uh, we, we dolled out the uh, frontal base and also the, uh, open the optic canal and start to remove the tumor removal. So after the internal developing of the tumor, uh, uh, we uh, uh, dissected the uh, tumor and uh, uh, arachnoid tissue and meticulously uh, dissected the uh, tumor and the uh, uh, left side optic nerve. And after that, uh, we opened the uh, right side optic canal and identified the uh, right side optic nerve and followed the posterity. In this case, the tumor uh, tightly adheres uh, right side of the can nerve, uh, but uh, we uh, could achieve the uh, total limb of the tumor after the netgraft procedure. So the, the through the uh, conventional the uh, microscopic approach, the uh, this patient showed the. Uh, uh, improvement of the uh, visual acuity uh, just after the operation without any complication. And uh, also, the, in this case, the tumor attachment to medical cell to the diaphragma cell. And also, the, this tumor had the uh, severe lateral extension. The, the tumor the, uh, extended the lateral side uh, uh, beyond the uh, uh, with circulatory system. So oh, in such a the case situation, uh, we usually the selected combined microscopic transcranial interhemispheric approach and endoscopic endonasal approach. So the this is a surgical the approach for the uh, summary of the 30 cases. So uh, we the uh, selected the microscopic transcranial interhemispheric approach, uh, 30 cases. And second, the uh, approach, the endoscopic endonasal approach, nine cases. And third, 
the endoscopic supraorbital eyebrow approach. And only one case we uh, applied uh, uh, combined microscopic and transcranial approach and endoscopic nasal approach. So the, uh, we think the uh, tumor attachment and uh, intercanalicular imaging are uh, the important factor uh, to the selected adequate strategy for tuberculum cell meningioma. So previously, the, we uh, analyzed the uh, characteristic of the optic canal invasion. So the, about 70% of the patients show the unilateral tumor invasion, and 30% of the uh, patients show the bilateral tumor invasion. And the detail of the uh, optic canal invasion, about 30% uh, of the patients show the uh, three side bolt invasion. It's meaning the tumor invaded the superior, media, inferior side of the of the canal invasion. And so the uh, 30, another 30% 30 of the patients show the uh, two uh, side bolt invasion. The superior media or inferior media, the uh, wall invasion. So, uh, attachment of the tumor is if the pranam sphenoid to the tubercle cell. Uh, and uh, we selected endoscopic endonasal approach. Maybe so we cannot remove the lateral side of the tumor. So, that is the limitation of endoscopic endonasal approach. So actually, this is a real case of the uh, endoscopic endonatal approach for the uh, pranam sphenoidale the tuberculum cell meningioma. So postoperatively, the, some of the small the remnant identify at the lateral side, uh, frontal base of the uh, this patient. So the transcranial approaches might be better for minimizing the postoperative neurosurgical deficit and long-term tumor control. On the other hand, if the attachment of tumor is tuberculum cell to the diaphragm cell, and the, this tumor is grown up like this, the characteristic of optic canal invasion, usually inferior medial wall. So uh, endoscopic anal approach is uh, the uh, set up for the removal of the disease. Tumor. So again, this is a recent our surgical strategy for tuberculum cell meningioma. So attachment of the tumor is uh, pranam sphenoidal tuberculum to cell, and the tumor is relatively large. We selected the microscopic transcranial approach. The tumor size is small or middle. We selected eyebrow subfrontal approach by using the endoscope. The attachment of the tumor, tuberculum cell to diaphragm cell, without uh, lateral extension, we selected the uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, the tumor has a uh, lateral extension, we selected my combined microscopic uh, transcranial approach and endoscopic endonasal approach. So this is the conclusion. So. Appropriate use of the endoscope has improved the efficiency and outcome of the surgery for tuberculosis cell meningioma. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, for Professor Hiroki's presentation. Very um very good one on the endoscopic approach. So shall I invite comments firstly from our chair, Professor Takashi? Oh, okay. Uh, I want to uh, give, I, I want to give, to give some uh, question and uh, comment from uh, two uh, discussion. Uh, please give some questions or uh, comments, uh, Dr. Kamaka. Uh, Professor Moritako, thank you very much. I think you've highlighted a very important point that 
just because we can do an endoscopic approach, everything cannot be done by the endoscopic procedure. I thank you for your uh, algorithm that you have presented. That's a very balanced and pragmatic uh, approach to these kind of tumors. Two small technical questions I had for you. Uh, I see that you use the 30 degree endoscope. Do you do that all the time or do you change uh, during your endonasal endoscopic procedure? That is one question. And the second okay. is how do you plan reconstruction? Okay. Uh, Okay, so the, uh, the first question, so we usually use uh, the 30 degree endoscope at the endoscopic endonasal approach, especially the, the uh, uh, during the tumor resection. And okay. so the, uh, on the other hand, the transcranial endo endoscopic approach, we usually use uh, zero degree, not to use uh, the angled the scope. And uh, the reconstruction of the skull base is uh, very important. Uh, so the both approach, but uh, the uh, more the uh, high risk of the CSF leakage at the endoscopic endonasal approach, not the transcranial approach. Uh, we usually the uh, suture the uh, dura at the uh, uh, around the cellar floor. Some of the uh, uh, Two or three stages after the we make the hammock the fashion, and after that uh, we uh, insert the fat in the uh, uh, subdural space, and after that uh, we cover the uh, that the dural tract the completely by using the nasoceptal flap widely, and after that we pack the sphenoid sinus, the uh, gel foam. The gelatin the, uh, material, the, uh, and after that, uh, we uh, uh, fix the, uh, uh, that the material by using the fibrin glue. That is our usual manner, yes. On the other hand, the transcranial, the endoscopic keyhole approach, the dural defect just only the cover the uh, photograph. That is uh, in a very the small, the uh, hole is uh, not so the big problem of the post-operative the CSF leakage at the transcranial approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe, uh, Alberto, any comments from you? Yes, yes, thank you, Ben. Monisa Costense, arigato gozaimasu. Very interesting uh, presentation. And I also appreciated very much uh, uh, the, the very balanced algorithm. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the key messages uh, you, you gave is that we need to master uh, as much as possible many techniques to be able to offer the best to our patients. <laughs> so it's not just uh, endoscopy, it's not just microsurgery, uh, it's not just keyhole, yeah. but we have to uh, manage uh, all of these techniques uh, to, to choose the best one. I have just uh, one question. Uh, you showed a couple of cases of uh, planum, small planum sphenoidale uh, meningiomas, uh, which you operated through a, a supraorbital approach. So my question is, uh, um, maybe some, some colleagues uh, would have chosen uh, a transsphenoidal approach for, this case, for those cases. Did you choose uh, the supraorbital uh, route because of the decreased uh, uh, risk of CSF leakage, or uh, what's what's the reason for that? Thank you. Ah uh, yes, so thank you for your comment, uh, the professor. The uh, credit. So the uh, usually the if we so the tumor attachment is uh, pranam sphenoidale. So if we uh, selected endoscopic endonasal approach, so some patients uh, show the possibility with the uh, anosomia, and also the there the high risk of the so the post-operative CFS leakage not so big problem, but uh, the, uh, we usually the achieve the uh, Simpson grade one the tumor resection is the most important for the long due tumor control of the the. Uh, especially the young or the middle-aged patient, not so the high-aged patient. So the through the transcranial approach, we can the, uh, completely the, uh, 
uh, remove the uh, attachment of the tumor, including the some of the dural tail. So that part we cannot so uh, the identify the margin of the uh, tumor is through the endonasal approach. So the usually the uh, if the tumor located the frontal base, so recently the, we the selected the uh, endoscopic transcranial approach. And the through the transcranial the subfrontal approach, they are the not so the important structure. Uh, so we can the easily the manage the uh, the tumor removal without the, any the uh, kind of the uh, so the problem. So that is a very not so big the uh, so not so technical uh, the procedure uh, very the safe and uh, uh, benefit for the many patients. So we usually the selected that procedure recently. Thank you. Yeah, I can see so so many hands raised for uh, <laughs> so uh, maybe shall I invite your daughter Islam, please uh, unmute yourself to uh, to ask your questions. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, uh, for your nice demonstration. Two basic questions. While doing endoscopic and another removal of the tumor. Uh, Tuberculosis meningioma. Sometimes the tumor is uh, not that much suckable, and sometimes it is uh, difficult uh, to remove through the endonasal approach. What what is your technique to remove the tumor when the tumor is not suckable, rather it is hard through endoscopic endonasal approach? As you know that sometimes it is difficult to predict in even in situated image that whether the tumor is uh, soft or Sometimes it is fibrous and non suckable Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, so the if the tumor is hot, the it's a very difficult. So yeah. the technically is very challenging. So anyway, so the in such a session, even in the transcranial approach, the it's a very the difficult. Then so the if the the attachment of tumor is uh, posterior side, it's meaning the attachment of tumor is uh, tuberculum cell to the diaphragm cell. The uh, we in our institute that uh, tumor of the surgical relative of the transcranial approach not good. So the we completely changed our strategy recently uh, through the endoscopic endonasal approach. So the we can directly the uh, 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 expose uh, the attachment of the tumor uh, through the endoscopic endonasal approach. So the that is a more the uh, suitable procedure for the if the tumor located the uh, uh, tubercular to the diaphragm cell uh, endoscopic endonasal approach is more safe the procedure even in the some of the fibrous and very hard of the tumor. Yeah, I have another question. In larger tubercular cell meningioma, you are preferring interhistoric approach and sacrificing yes. the olfactory nerve. Yeah. What is the benefit of going through interhistoric interhistoric approach rather we rather going through subfrontal approach? Oh uh, yes, so uh, in so by the usually we don't sacrifice the olfactory the nerve uh, through the we select the interhemispheric approach. But if the tumor uh, the uh, extended lateral side, so the in such a situation the we usually cut. The one side of the olfactory nerve. So to the perform the more than ridiculous the tumor removal, the to preserve the uh, optic function. That's the very the so if we the uh, preserve the olfactory nerve of the region side, that's very obstructive. And the exposure of the tumor is more the difficult. So such so that is a very the high risk of the our. Uh, Possibility of the deterioration of the uh, optic function. So the usually we preserve the uh, if possible we preserve the both side. But uh, in the case of the uh, severely the lateral the, uh, the tumor has a severe lateral extension, we uh, usually cut the one side of the olfactory now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
。OK。そうですね。何か,か、硬い時の何かそういう tips はありますかみたいなことはいかがでしょうかあ、uh, yes. So,、uh, so, if the tumor is very hard,、uh, maybe the we so cut the sharp the, the dissection and the, the, the so, Even in some of the very fibrous, very hard the tumor, once we cut some of the tough membrane, we can reach some of the soft, the, we can identify some of the soft the component of the tumor in every case of the meningioma. So, neticulous the procedure is only the uh, uh, so way to remove such of the tumor. But, so, it, of course,、uh, if the tumor is very soft, very the tumor is very easy and the Uh, not time consuming, but、uh, if the tumor is very hard、uh, or the recurrent the,、uh, cases, uh, maybe so uh, we uh, perform the neticulous the procedure and uh, we uh, uh, so、um, it's a very the, difficult question. Yes. So, the preoperative the, the prediction is、uh, so. Sometimes it's possible, but sometimes it's not very difficult. So, even in the、so、T2 weighted MR image, sometimes it's very、uh, helpful for us、uh, to the estimate the hardness of the tumor, but so it's not so、uh, completely much the interoperating finding. So,、uh, anyway, the,、uh, we the,、uh, change the, our strategy、uh, according to the、uh, Interoperating the tumor hardness、yeah. every time we、uh, perform such a procedure. I see. So, uh, uh, another. So, sorry. Yeah, another、uh, hands raised by Dr. Nair,、uh, Archit Al Lair. Can you unmute yourself? Archif? Okay, maybe I、uh, have invited another、uh, hand raised by uh, Dr. Uh, Harley. Hello, hello. Hello,、uh, hello uh, Archif? Uh, yeah, yeah. can you hear me? I, yeah, 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 please. Ask your.、Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry for the interruption.、Uh, I, I am Dr. Archif、uh, uh, from Trivandrum. Thank you, Professor, for your excellent and well balanced talk on the、uh, diaphragm and the tuberculosis and the meningioma. My question is regarding endoscopic endonasal approach to the,、uh, the tuberculosis and the meningioma. Because many often, very often, the pituitary stroke will be in close relation to the tumor. So the vascularity will be come from the Superior hypophysis a r t e r y from the both sides. So, what is your strategy in preserving、uh, vascularity to that、uh, so、pituitary stroke? Because patient, many of the time, patients come to us without any endocrinological problem. So, after surgery, p a t i e n t will have the endocrinological problem. So, preserving superior hypophysis a r t e r y bilaterally or even one side is very essential. What is your strategy in preserving the To the or the vascularity to the pituitary stroke. Okay, thank you for your good、uh, question. So, the,、uh, usually the, in the case of the meningioma, so the normal pituitary gland the,、uh, shifted the, uh, uh, one side. So, at first, we cut the、uh, dramata of the c e l l u l o v a and after the internal developing of the tumors, we can. The,、uh, uh, So, identify the、uh, tumor margin. And、uh, the, also, the, we the,、uh, uh, identify the uh, uh, normal, the lateral edge of the、uh, medial edge of the、uh, normal pituitary gland. So, the, we can the,、uh, uh, so the, uh, shift or the,、uh, retract the normal pituitary gland and make the surgical cord on the posterior side. And also, the, we identify the Usually the pituitary s t r o k e So the, in the many cases, the, we cut one side of the,、uh, the inferior hyperficial artery, the,、uh, but the, that is not so big problem of the postoperative endocrinal status. 
So, of course, uh, the uh, post just after the post operation, uh, the we the perform the uh, uh, replacement of the hormonal the uh, every patient. But the, within the three months, the though the many patient not required uh, no replacement of the hormonal the uh, treatment. So the uh, so in this the strategy is so the we apply the um, more than not so not only the meningioma. So the we usually the uh, so the uh, cut or one side of the uh, inferior hypogeality at the case in the case of the craniopharyngioma or the some the uh, supracellar tumor that is not our the usual the manner for the endoscopic endonasal approach. Anyway, the we can the uh, usually the we could identify the uh, uh, margin of the more normal pituitary gland the, through the endoscopic endonasal approach. So uh, after that, the, we can the, separate the tumor margin and the uh, pituitary gland. Mm. Uh, just one more doubt. You, you said uh, inferior hypophysal artery. Inferior, uh, that yeah. means you, are, you will open the cella and you do the transposition. Transcranial? You, you mean inferior hypophysal or superior hypophysal? Yes, you... inferior, inferior, inferior. And the superior, so we usually the completely the preserve. Superior, the uh, hypophysiality is very the important, the uh, artery for the preserve the uh, optic the function. So we don't never the, uh, sacrifice uh, that artery. So in all these cases, you open the cell and you do some yeah. transposition of the uh, pituitary gland. Yes, yes. Is there any subset you can avoid that? So the, if the so so the some the so small the branch of the superior hypergeality uh, connect to the stalk. Yes. So yeah, we preserve as much as possible. But the, in the case of meningioma, usually the uh, compress that artery posterior and the superior side. So after the tumor removal, the, the, that, the, uh, we can make some the uh, space between yes. the tumor and the, the superior hypergeal artery. So the, if the, the that artery is not the... So of course, we cut some of the feeder for the tumor. Uh, is a small feeder. We cut and coagulate, but so the usually the uh, main the uh, uh, artery we can the preserve. Mm. Thank you, Professor. Okay. okay. Uh, next, uh, maybe Doctor Kiran, Harry Kiran. <coughs> uh, uh, thank you, Doctor Marisako. Excellent uh, demonstration of uh, videos. So I have two questions for you. Uh, one yeah. is uh, uh, you said that you in one case you did uh, both to transcranial and endoscopic procedure. So was there was it done in the same sitting or was there any duration of care in between two procedures? And my second question is: Do you use postoperative lumbar drain in the endonasal procedures? Okay. If you use, how many days do you use the lumbar? Drain? Okay. Yes, sir. that is a very the the good question. So the uh, usually we uh, don't insert uh, the lumbar drainage of the endoscopic endonasal approach, but the, the so the transcranial approach that we usually insert the uh, lumbar drainage the uh, before the, the as after so during the uh, the operation after the tumor removal we uh, remove the lumbar drainage uh, as the operator theater uh, and so the uh, Procedure of the transcranial endoscope and the uh, microscope is almost the same. But uh, the instrument is uh, we change the uh, microscope and the uh, endoscope. So at the we so apply the keyhole, uh, the transcranial endoscopic approach, the single shaft, the mono shaft, the, some the instrument is very useful. So it's the instrument is the complete same of the endoscopic endonasal approach. Yeah. So the we so usually the uh, uh, change the, some of the our uh, the instrument uh, for the uh, detection of the tumor the, uh, 
it will so um, some different is uh, the transcranial the conventional microscopic surgery and the endoscopic right? but the, the manner of the tumor rejection is the uh, same so the at first we uh, uh, drill the uh, attachment of the tumor and uh, after that debug the trix surgery of the tumor and uh, we perform the internal development of the tumor and finally we achieve the total tumor removal mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharif, Sujan Sharif. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Morisako, for your excellent presentation on uh, TSM. I have uh, uh, two questions regarding endoscopic endonasal. Yeah. Uh, some people believe that uh, endoscopic endonasal surgery uh invite uh, anosmia postoperative anosmia yeah, yeah, yeah and after harvesting uh nasoceptal flap the anosmia rate uh, will more so what do you believe on that and then uh two number two question is uh, uh what is your bony exposure in yeah. case of endoscopic endonasal yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, do you op uh, open the uh, bilateral uh, uh cavernous carotid dura or above Thank you. Yes. So, okay. So that would be very the good question. So, one question. So, uh, in our the experience, so the uh, patient not so show the any anosmia after the endoscopic endonasal approach because the attachment of tumor is uh, the tuberculosis to the or the more the posterior side. So, if the attachment of tumor more anterior side, that is a very the high risk of the postoperative the anosmia. So maybe, so uh, if the attachment tumor is uh, just a tuberculum cellar, maybe endoscopic endonasal approach, not so the big problem, uh, post-operative the anosmia. And so the uh, second question, so the, we usually the, remove the bony structure very widely the, from the uh, around so the uh, posterior side of a problem and so the uh, drill out the uh, cellar floor, and also the way the completely expose the bilateral, the, uh, internal carotid artery of the dura mater, both sides. Yeah. So, because uh, the, uh, so we the retract the, uh, so the carotid after, uh, remove the bony structure of the ICA, we can slightly retract the ICA itself, lateral side. So that we can make more the wide surgical corridor at, uh, for the, uh, the around the cell to the tuberculum cell. So that is very the important. So the uh, preparation of the tumor rejection. Yes. Arigato gozaimasu. Yes. Okay. Uh, can I ask uh, the, the last few questions uh, uh, to uh, Professor uh, Morisako? So uh, I have two questions. Uh, the yeah. first one about uh, for your bony opening. Uh, do you need to drill bilateral posterior kinoid in your in your bony opening? What do you think the role of drilling the posterior kinoid is? My second question is about uh, if you have those back uh, to backroom cellar meningioma. You mentioned you do it uh, uh, in a, in transcranial and also the endoscopic. Um, and also the endoscopic uh, uh, approach. So we should do it in a stage operation. So you uh, finish uh, one stage and then go to the second stage on another day. Or do you do it uh, at the same time? Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank and you. Uh, which, one, which one first? And also uh, how okay. many uh, do you separate if you consider uh, take it, uh, two days? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your words. Uh, good question. So the in the case of the relatively large the uh, uh, tubercle meningioma and the assessment is the most posterior side. Maybe the posterior cranioidectomy is very effective. So the we can make the large the surgical corridor from the below caudal to the uh, the uh, cranial top side. So maybe so uh, if the tumor is relatively large. Maybe uh, we usually perform the posterior cranioidectomy before the tumor rejection. Yeah. But the, in the case of the relatively small, the tuberculosis meningioma, and the tumor location is a mi only middle side, midline, 
And so the post equilibrium is usually not required. So only the relatively large, the, the attachment tumor is uh, the extend the diaphragm and the reach to the uh, tumor posterior edge is the uh, flow of the third ventricle. Mm. In mm. such a situation, the posterior equilibrium is uh, recommended. And so the second question, to we usually, if the tumor is large, and so the, we apply the combined surgery uh, with, uh, uh, so perform the one stage, not the two stage. Okay. Because so the, we can uh, so the, uh, check the, uh, the reach, the tumor, and the margin of the both side. So that is very the benefit for the tumor resection. So, but uh, at first, we usually perform the endoscopic endonasal procedure and switch to the transcranial approach. Because uh, the, through the endoscopic endonasal approach, we can remove the uh, bony structure of the, uh, the frontal base and also that we can devascularize the tumor through the bottom of the tumor. So, at first, we applied endoscopic endonasal approach. And after that, the uh, we the added the tumor resection the uh, through the uh, transcranial approach, but the same time yes. I see. Uh, thank you so much again. A very uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation by uh, Professor uh, Maurice Sacco. So uh, also uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor uh, Nunes uh, Massimiliano cannot join us uh, today. So, um, but uh, still, we have a very uh, good presentation from two very expert uh, speakers. So, uh, shall I invite uh, Professor Kato to wrap up the session? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Thanks so much. So, uh, we had a very good uh, the two lectures, and also the good chair, uh, the, Dr. Uh, Tarashi, and also uh, Dr. Uh, Bikram and the uh, Abel uh, as a good uh, discussants. Uh, today, the, the most uh, dated of the endoscopes. I, I think it's a time for the endoscopic procedure. Uh, even uh, in Japan, we have a <coughs> board exam, board, uh, uh, certified uh, the endoscopic area. So, Morisako Sensei is uh, one of the top uh, endoscopic uh, neurosurgeons in Japan, uh, under the Dr. Goto Sensei okay. and also uh, Ohata Sensei. I think uh, maybe Atik, uh, he uh, invited Dr. Goto Sensei for his place, and uh, uh, Goto Sensei demonstrated very good uh, the cases I heard. I think in the future, maybe the, you can uh, visit uh, as a uh, next part, please, or uh, uh, maybe uh, I think uh, uh, we can invite them. Oh, uh, thank you, <laughs> And uh, okay. uh, we will see the chance to their the surgery. Uh, it's very, very important, not only the, uh, the read the book and also the uh, listen to the lecture. So uh, it's a time for uh, the minimally invasive uh, because that is a patient wish. So I think uh, we must learn about the endoscopic procedure uh, in neurosurgical or spinal, uh, any field in neurosurgery. Uh, anyway, the said <coughs> our the wireless uh, webinar uh, very uh, fruitful. Uh, we learned a lot from most of them. Thank you so much. This is it. Yes. Um, uh, again, a very wonderful uh, educational uh, lectures from two uh, experts and an excellent. Uh, very uh, educational um, discussion among uh, the audience. So I would also like to thank uh, uh, Professor Shivin for broadcasting uh, this webinar in the WeChat channel. So uh, again, uh, this uh, this a uh, bye bye for all of us, and uh, I would I would I would uh, hope that all of you uh, enjoy today's uh, ACNS YNS webinar. So on behalf of the Educational Committee of ACNS uh, YNS, uh, so um, uh, I'm, I'm calling the end of this uh, uh, webinar. So we will definitely meet again and have another uh, great uh, educational uh, webinar uh, in, in uh, the next time. So again, it's a bye-bye to all of us. And uh, thank, you so, uh, thank you so much for all of you to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye.
。ありがとうございます。はい。すぐに東京で会いますので。はい。またお願いします。安倍先生、ありがとう。ありがとうございます。安倍先生。はい。安倍先生、ありがとう。ありがとう。ありがとうございます。おやすみなさい、インジャパン。おやすみなさい。See you all next time. Nice to see you all.